the building was going vertical um, and things were happening so fast that the, the scanning process and validating didn't really make any sense because things were already being built. Um, there wasn't much they could do with the data other than just DAC document the as built. Uh, the one thing that we focus our product on and the one thing that I learned in the industry is time is your most valuable asset. I know a lot of people say that, but <laughs> most AEC techs or most people doing AC work are really, really hard workers. They, they start, if not six or seven in the morning, and they work till five or six at night. Um, they, they're not a nine to five worker. Um, we, we don't do that in this industry. There's no ability to. Um, also, that there's never enough time in the day. Um, I know I, I stayed late many of times. We got there early. And then I, towards December, when we were doing a lot of pursuits, um, I ended up coming in on Saturday or Sunday. So there's just never enough time to get what you need to get done. Um, so the last thing we decided we were gonna do is, is no matter what, no matter what we had to do, we were gonna build the best systems for our industry. Um, I grew up in construction. When I was 13, my mom had me sweeping out houses. My mom was a residential builder and my dad was a land developer. So I started out on job sites really, really young, cutting grass, sweeping out houses and worked my up through the process. Um, started building houses when I was 18 um, with my dad. And then I started developing land when I was 19 as a, as a senior project manager um, with his civil side, actually going out and cutting raw land down and creating final plot neighborhoods um, for other builders. Uh, flash forward a couple of years, I went to work for a large Autodesk reseller that was starting this construction technology group with scanners and drones and field mobile technology on tablets. Um, and then went to work for one of my clients, big, big GC, worked my way up to project solutions manager. And, then, and that's what kind of transitioned to me to starting my own company. So it's kind of been a journey, but it all kind of makes sense. I, I think when I look back at how I got here, I'm like, oh, I was just jumping from job to job, but it looked like I was being strategic. So I'll go with that. Um, when we talk about convoluted recommendations, um, it, what really happens is software uh, developers and software solutions, they don't want to tell you exactly what computer you need. And, and a lot of that is because they build their software to work on any computer, but any computer won't give you a good experience. Um, this is a great, great example. This is the, on the right, you'll see this is Autodesk Revit recommended system. Um, and and what, the funny thing I like to joke about is if you're seeing CPU type, next to it, you'll see single or multi-core Intel or Xeon processor. Intel only makes two processors. It's either a, it's either a Xeon or it's an iCore. And they don't make single core processors. So literally they've specified any processor for Autodesk Revit. Um, it, it goes a little farther down, but when you kind of start out with that and say, we're not gonna help you pick a CPU, um, that can kind of leave people picking the wrong computer, right? Because it doesn't matter what computer you have, it's the right computer. Um, and that's really not, not the best way to spec out a computer if you do day-to-day -day -day work in Autodesk Revit. What we've set out to do, um, especially for Autodesk Revit and all these other programs you see at the bottom is to build the best experience for the user, we had to understand the software. Revit is a single core, meaning that it only leverages one core. It doesn't matter how many cores you have in your system. You have 22 core processor, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how nice the processor is. Revit will only use one core. So the best performance indicator when you're building a Revit system is how fast does those cores go? What we do um, is we overclock our processors. A lot of times people think of overclocking in a bad way, but um, we like to call it more tuning. So we take an Intel processor that has a lot of potential and we maximize that potential to make sure you get the fastest processor possible. Um, right now, <clears throat> with our 5.3 gigahertz all-core overclock, we are the fastest manufacturer in the world. We're the only people that offer that um, overclocked processor speed um, and the only people that have a three-year warranty with su support that we have, advanced RMA programs and um, support from five, uh, excuse me, 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. coast to coast. Um, we have a sub 30 minute response time from support, which we, we think is fantastic. 
and that when you reach out to support, you actually talk to a person. So that sub 30 minute time is actually speaking to one of our, our support reps. Um, additionally, and I'll touch on it in a little bit, we've done some things on, on our strategic partnership. So Bimbox, we don't just offer hardware support for our systems. We now offer software support for Autodesk. So if you're an AC tech where you're someone that is using an AC program and you contact our support and you're having problems, we can diagnose it and help you if it's a hardware problem or if it's a software problem. And that's a big thing for our clients. A lot of the IT managers that the groups and clients we work with, they're not always the best at Autodesk products. And, and some of their fear can come from, what do I do when things go wrong? It's really nice for those people to know that they can just send and send their clients and send their people to us and we'll help take care of them. We kind of augment to be an add-on to a company's IT partner. Um, if you have to be mobile, which we understand with COVID hitting, a lot of people say, I can't deal with the desktop. I need to be able to pick up and go. Um, we do offer a mobile form factor of our Striker desktop. The Striker Mobile 17 is going to be the same components that's in our desktop. We don't liquid cool it, so it doesn't go quite as fast, but it is the same desktop processor. It has the same desktop graphics card. It has the same desktop RAM. It is for all intent and purpose, a desktop replacement. Um, so this is, this is our mobile line. It's the fastest mobile workstation laptop that you can get. Um, we, we outperform Dell, we outperform HP, we outperform Lenovo um, by a pretty big distance. Um, so let's jump in here. If you do post-process rendering, meaning you use like a program like V-Ray or Corona Renderer, or you use reality capture products. So you're using a drone to capture images and then recreate an environment, or you're using a laser scanner. Our Osprey series is the best for you. We actually partnered with the AMD, Leica and Faro on this, the, the two largest laser scanning, terrestrial scanning companies, and one of the, the second largest uh, you know, uh, processor manufacturers to create this series. Um, what we did with those companies was work with them and their algorithmic teams to find the best hardware to run their, their, their software. So the Osprey, we have up to, up to 64 cores, um, which exceeds any Intel dual Xeon system. Um, we're about 15 to 20% faster than any dual Xeon system, including a $35,000 Dell, which we'll show you. And, and our Osprey's, I think, starts by $8,200. Um, one of the big things with Osprey is when you're working with reality capture data, a lot of people that are doing scans end up creating somewhere between 400 and 500 gigabytes of data every week. When you think about a solid state drive, most consumer drives are only two to up to two terabytes. So if you're creating 500 gigabytes per week, a two terabyte drive will cover you for about three weeks, maybe four, and then you run out of space. We actually use server grade solid state drives. So you can have up to 7.8 drives, a 7.8 terabytes on, on any specific drive and you can have four, four drives in a system. So you start to get up there in the actual capacity to about 30 terabytes worth of really, really fast storage. Um, one thing I like to point out, so this is a great, when I was, when I was working in sales, when the market tanked in 2008, um, I, I got a book and it was called The Slight Edge. So there's a great story about the British cycling team. And if you're not a cyclist, I promise you'll get this. Um, back in 1908, 2003, they had won one gold medal in the Olympics. Um, top manu They were so bad. Top manufacturing of cycles wouldn't sell them bikes. They didn't want them riding their bike. They were so bad. In 2003, they hired a new coach. And from 2003 to 2008, they won 60% of gold medals in cycling. They won nine Olympic records and they set seven world records. And the big thing for me was when I read this story is what changed, right? Something changed in 2003. Um, their coach believed in this thing called the aggregation of marginal gains. Um, the idea is if you take everything you do in a process and you improve it by 1%, doesn't have to be a big number, 1%. Over time, that 1% and everything you do makes up a big difference. 
And we approach building systems in the same way, right? So what we do is on the, on the processor, if we can tune the processor to get it go 10 to 15% faster than a stock Intel processor, it's probably closer to 25 or 30%, but let's just stay, let's just stay at 10 and 15. If we can get the processor to go 10 or 15% faster, if we can use high performance RAM that goes 30 to 35% faster, if we go with the top line, top of the line solid state drives, the NVMe drives, they go about 20 to 30% faster. And every component in our system gets you an increase over a stock Dell or HP system. It creates a massive amount of performance gain over the course of a year or two years or three years for the end user. I don't know if you experience this now or if you, if you ever had problems. When I was in the industry, it can take a long time to load files. Loading files just to get them in the application can take a long time. Um, I would say I had Revit files that took anywhere from two and a half to three minutes up to sometimes 15 minutes when I was using, or well, it was collaboration for Revit back then. Now it would be called BIM 360 design. And I even had Navisworks models with up to 45 links in it. And that would take 10 to 15 minutes. Um, when we're able to cut that time down from 15 to five or, or four to 30 seconds, over the course of a year, all the times that you load those files, um, it becomes a big number of time savings. Additionally, when you're working those applications and you execute on a function, it can take 30 seconds or 20 seconds for, for the program to actually execute and save that data. If we can cut that down by another 20%. What ends up happening is you get massive savings over the course of a year. I don't think a lot of people actually ever recognize it. You, you might feel it, right? That, that you're wasting time, that it takes a long time to do things. But if you've never had a high performance computer or a computer that was built for what you do, uh, you, you might not actually know that there's something else out there. Um, the big thing for us using this aggregation of marginal gains approach is when we talk to people, when we talk to clients, we end up having our system about 30% faster than our fastest competitor. And I have a video, I'll show you a quick testimonial from one of our clients. We're, we're closer to 39% um, in all their side-by-side -side benchmarks and, and that were specific to what they do in their day-to-day -day workflow. But the idea is if we could get you 5% an increase in your productivity, what would that do for you? And what would that do to the bottom line for your company? It, it's a big number. Um, in this industry, and that's why talking about ROI, I think is kind of taboo. I remember when I was buying products and people came into my office and said, oh, we're going to save you 30% on your RFIs, or we're going to cut down your, your wasted downtime by 30%. I always looked at them and said, who's getting fired on our job site, right? How are we going to get that return? Right? And it was always more of an efficiency gain. When I look at the, the, what we're talking about here and being more productive on your computer or whatnot, we're looking at the potential ability to bill out more. And I, and I look at that from the standpoint, when I was working and I had 10 or 12 people under me, every day at the end of the day, they'd go and clock their hours as to each job they worked on. And our, our company, which was under the Precon department, which had our BIM teams and our laser scanning teams, we build out against jobs. Um, if we were wasting an hour every day, that was an hour of, of potential billable revenue that we couldn't bill out to a job. So if we were charging and billing out $100 an hour, every day wasting an hour cost us $100 per person. With 10 to 15 people, we were between $1,000 and $1,500 a day of wasted downtime. Um, as that started to stack up, my pre-con manager, it clicked with him. What I was talking about was increasing his internal billable rate or inc increasing his internal billable revenue, um, which, which he didn't understand computers. He didn't want to buy a bunch of hardware, but he did understand the impact to his bottom line, which was kind of how I got these. I'm gonna go through these next one pretty quick, <clears throat> just showing components that we use. Um, on the right, you might be what's in your computer right now, traditional solid state drives. Typically people say they're really fast and that it's an upgrade. We don't use those. We use these new drives that came out on the left. They're called NVMe solid state drives. They are 
11 times faster than a traditional solid state drive. It's actually pretty cool. The images you're seeing on the screen, depending upon your screen size, are probably pretty big. These things are the size of a bubblegum stick. And you put them in your computer and your computer starts five, 10 seconds, boots up to Windows. Um, and when you open files, it just almost happens instantaneously. RAM, we use high performance RAM on the, on the left. Most people, most manufacturers use the RAM you see on the right. We see about a 34% overall system performance. The system is just snappy. When you do things, it happens quick. Um, I know in, in AutoCAD or Revit, when you make a execute on, on something, you see that little green bar at the bottom. People say it's the progress bar or the lack of progress bar sometimes I like to call it. Um, and this just makes that happen extremely quick. So you don't just sit there and waste time while your computer's spinning wheels. Graphics cards, this is a big one for us. So the card you see on the right is the card that has been recommended to our industry by Autodesk, by a lot of other manufacturers, and it's starting to change. So when virtual reality came back, came out, and this, not everybody does virtual reality, but this kind of started the whole movement towards what we do of better systems for what people do. Um, when, when, when VR was coming out, everybody that had these expensive Dells, expensive HPs with these high-end quadro cards, quote unquote, professional graphics cards, they didn't meet the minimum requirement for VR. Um, and people started scratching their head. They said, why are we spending all these money on these high performance cards? Or why would Autodesk or, or the manufacturer recommend them? And it kind of comes down to this. So Quadro cards are physical replicas of their GeForce counterpart. The card on here on the left is actually a consumer graphics card, um, something you'd find in, in a gaming system. If you look at the specifications on both these, they're physical replicas. They have the same number of shading units. They have the same number of cores. They have the same cache. They, they have all the same components. Um, the performance is actually the same as far as the theoretical performance. But when you look up at the clock speed, and clock speed is going to be how fast the processor is actually moving. The card on the left has a higher clock speed. If you notice the boost clock and the memory clock actually are higher. The reason being, and that's why it has two fans is, it's going faster than the Quadro card. People might say, well, why would anybody pay more for the Quadro card? Quadro cards come with more RAM on it, which really is for media and entertainment people when they're doing big renderings. Like if you're doing an animation for, um, I don't know, a studio in LA for an animated movie or Pixar. They need the cards on the right because it just does a lot of rendering. Additionally, they slow the processor down so the card doesn't overheat. Card on the left is made for gaming. People sit down and, and game and they want the fastest refresh rate possible. What we found is with AC applications, a lot of it's just vectored line work. The big performance together is, is how fast it can refresh. So when you zoom in, it doesn't take a while to redraw that image. When you pan around a 3D model, um, it doesn't even stutter. It doesn't disappear and then redraw. You'll see a consistent image across the screen. So we were one of the first manufacturers that actually were the first manufacturer in the AEC space that actually recommended and used GeForce cards. Now, everybody's kind of started to trend that way. You're actually seeing Autodesk say, you can use GeForce cards, but Quadro is better. So why would Autodesk ever say Quadro cards? Well, they're partnered with NVIDIA. And when they call NVIDIA and say, what's the best graphics card for our people? NVIDIA says, of course, the Quadro card. It's the most expensive card we sell. <laughs> but the problem is, is that's been at a cost to the users and it's been a detriment to their performance. We broke that mold and, and we look at what the right component is for our users. That's how we approach this. We have partnerships, but we're not locked in with any hardware manufacturer. We pick the best tool for our client. Um, this is gonna be a big one. Um, and I kind of wanna jump to what this is. So the way we make our processes go faster than anyone else, it's really important, is what we call the direct die process. And it's, it happens with a D-Lib. So if you look at the bottom right of this image where the Intel 9th Gen i core is, 
that square aluminum piece is called a heat spreader. It actually is, is welded to the CPU die. Um, if you look at that top left image where we're applying a liquid metal, that small little rectangle is actually the CPU die. So the die is small. What happens is that die gets extremely hot and heats up as the processor starts running. The way that a traditional system works is that that processor die dissipates heat upward into that heat spreader and the cooler that'll be attached to that square rectangle pulls the heat out or lets the heat transfer into it and then fans blow across that cooler continuing the process trying to keep that die cool. Problem is aluminum's not that conductive and air cooling is not the best way to do this. What we do is we actually take off, we break the solder and remove that aluminum piece. We polish down the die on the top left that you see, and then we apply a liquid metal. We mount our cooler with a copper face blade directly to that die. It allows heat to be transmitted and allows that die to cool down a lot more, which means it can go faster, longer, and doesn't ever slow down. Intel processors, come with a three-year warranty. Not ours, we self-warrant our processors because we modify them. But the problem is, is when your processor heats up, it slows down so it doesn't burn up. Intel has that three-year warranty that don't just let it over the processors burn up. So regardless of what's going on, um, the hotter it gets, if you can't keep control on the temperature, it slows down. I don't know if you've ever had that experience where at the end of the day, you come back from lunch and it feels like your computer's dragging. It is dragging. And that's because it's been overheating all day. It's been heating up and the computer can't keep it, up, keep it cool. If you've ever had a desktop under your desk and it felt like the temperature in the room was increasing, that's what's happening when a computer is cooling. It's that heat coming off the processor die, going through the cooler and then being dissipated in the air. There's two different ways to cool a computer. Um, on the left, you'll see a liquid cooling method. On the right, you'll see an air cooling method. I know we're going kind of into minutia, but I always like to teach people a little bit about a computer so they can understand what we do. On the left, that is a 120 millimeter radiator, which is the square box you see. It has all those fins in it. So a fan will pull air through those fins, which will have the heat spread through them and it'll dissipate out. And it pumps water from the radiator, much like your car, directly down to that circular co copper base plate where that'll be attached directly to um, either the heat spreader of the processor or with ours directly to the die. Um, the process continues. And, and the one on the right you see, this is an air cooler. And that's a really, really high end air cooler. Not all of them look like that. Um, that would sit directly on the heat spreader, let the heat come up through those heat pipes, go to those fins, and then air is blown through. When people ask me what the difference between those two options on cooling are, I always like to go back to the example of if you have a hot pan coming off, coming off the uh, stovetop. When most people pull it off the stovetop, they don't start blowing on it to cool down. The first thing they do, well, they put it under water, right? The water is able to dissipate that heat a lot quicker than air. So that's why we use liquid cooling. We actually use a 360 millimeter radiator. So it's three times as big as that, which allows more heat to dissipate, which allows for better cooling. So we're constantly able to keep the processor cool. That's how we're able to run at the same clock speed at that 5.3, all day long. The next thing I want to talk to you about is case design, because this is extremely important too. And if you work in the industry, I just want you to keep thinking about a computer is just a complex system or not even that complex system, but it's a system much like a mechanical system or a building. Part of being able to keep that processor cool is keeping airflow. Because when you look at the inside of a computer, it's kind of like an oven. Um, you're sending electrical current through um, through wires, and, and then you need to get that heat off there because they heat up a, as the current goes through. On the left, you'll see an Alienware, uh, Alienware see, uh, excuse me, computer, and they have a 120 millimeter radiator. 
Okay, so that's that 120 millimeter radiator we saw. It's got a little alien on the water block, the piece that attaches it to the CPU. So that's good, but it's just not very good because a 120 millimeter radiator can't dissipate heat. On the right, we'll see this is another desktop. It has a 240 millimeter radiator. The problem there is it just doesn't have much other airflow. So it has, it's pulling, pulling air through that radiator, which is kind of pulling hot air into the case and hoping that the air is pushed out the back. Still not a very effective way to cool. This is one of our desktops. Um, if you're able to take a look at this, we put two big fans on the back and three on the bottom that are mounted to our radiator. The way this system works, is air is pulled in the bottom and up through the radiator. So we're, we're, we're not fighting gravity. We have, we have warm air coming up, right? So cool air being pulled in, it heats up a little bit. And then those two back fans just pull through, pull it all the way through the case. Our case is extremely cool. Um, and this is one of the ways that we can continue to have high performance and have really low temperatures, which is why they go so fast. This is a great chart. And, and if you take anything away from this, you don't have to know a ton, but the, the aha moment comes from the fact that coolers are very, very important. That's all I want you to take away from this. Um, this is an I, Intel i9 9900K, the, the fastest processor that, that has existed, period. That's what we use in our strikers and our striker M17. Um, when you look at the left, this is going to be different manufacturers that use a specific type of cooling. And then on the right, we're going to look at different clock speeds from 5.3 down to stock. When it's at stock, the, the computer is just allowing the processor to boost up when it can and then dial it back when it doesn't need to, when you're not doing anything. So the first three you see there, Dell, HP, and Lenovo use an air cooling system which we kind of just spoke about. At 5.3 gigahertz, they, don't, they can't turn on. 5.2, they don't turn on. 5.1, they don't turn on. And at five gigahertz, they're going 100 degrees Celsius and on the verge of failing. At 80 degrees Celsius, computers start to slow themselves down. That is almost like an oven. When you think about that, ADC is, is pr pretty hot. Um, so at five gigahertz, they're slowing down and at stock speeds, which is the really important thing I wanted to kind of take home with is at stock speeds, they're slowing themselves down. They can't even go the full speed of the processor. Um, the important thing about that is these companies all sell a product with this processor, ship it knowing that it's not even going to be able to even put out the potential output that Intel says the processor can, can put, provide. So that's a big deal. I mean, when someone's selling a computer and leaving potential on the table, this is where we say they're not taking it far enough for our industry. The next line you'll see, that's gonna be the MSI logo, Alienware logo, and a VoxX, which is another performance computer company. They, they can't run at 5.3, they can't go with 5.2, they can't run at 5.1 gigahertz. At five gigahertz, they have the same problem. They're going 100 degrees Celsius and at stock speeds, they're still slowing down. Our system with the 360 millimeter radiator and the direct eye process can run 5.3, 5.2, 5.1, 5.0 and stock all under 80 degrees Celsius. So that's the big thing. As long as we can stay under that threshold for the duration of the day while you're working, you never have any performance issues. And, and that's one of the things. If you're ever talking to another manufacturer about systems and they don't bring up cooling, they're not bringing it up for the fact that they have problems with it. And that's one of the big things for us. Um, this is a great example, Clark Construction. And after this, I'll show you a quick video from Clark, one of their, one of their techs. Um, they, they were testing out computers. They got one of ours, they got an HP, they got a Dell, they got a Box, they got an Alienware, they had a Lenovo, and they just did the testing side by side. There's what you call Revit Benchmark. We actually created our own, but there's one out there. A benchmark runs the same files and the same instructions in sequence on every computer. It records the time that the computer took to run each part of the sequence. 
and then gives you a result, which breaks down how long it took for everything. And then it has a total amount. Um, our system with the identical specs of box X ran the Brevet benchmark 39.3% faster. They actually ran an extended test. They cheated the test and made it run 10 times in a row. And if you notice, we actually, that difference actually increased. That comes from the fact after running 10 times, the computer was heating up, the cooler couldn't keep it cool. So performance started slowing down. Um, if you ran it 20 times, it would continue to increase. Our systems run fast all day and that's a big impact. This is a great one, Faith Technologies. Faith is a massive, uh, close to a billion dollar electrical contractor. <clears throat> all over the country, but I believe out of Minnesota, or excuse me, uh, I can't even pronounce the name of their city. Uh, excuse me on that one. But Faith was having some issues. Um, they do a lot of industrial plants and they also do a lot of data centers. So Faith started a new project and using BIM 360 design, all of a sudden the sinking portion of that process started taking anywhere from 30 to 45 minutes. Um, that was a big problem for them. It jumped from 15 to 45 minutes. So they saw that as a $107,000, $107,000 in wasted downtime. They had 45 techs that were opening files four or five times a day, 30 minute increase by all those techs. It added up to a ton of money that they were bleeding out. So they got all these systems, um, very similar to Clark, put them side by side, hit sync and open, and we were able to cut them down to four minutes, which they saw as a $107,000 savings every month. So they were able to pay for the systems, I believe in two months, if not three, and uh, it made a big impact for them. So I, I think this is where we kind of come in. Not many people would ever sped up or accelerated or understood BIM 360 design. The big thing is while BIM 360 design is a cloud product, when you sync, the product has to compare what's in the cloud and what's changed in the cloud with what's on your local desktop. And that comparison portion happens inside of Revit. And Revit is a single core program. Our computers going faster made that process happen quicker. So we're really proud of this. And um, I, we're the only people out there actually acknowledging the challenge of BIM 360 design. Here are some companies that we that are our clients. We've got some big ones and we've got some smaller ones. Um, we love them all. Um, <laughs> I'll tell you the smaller ones end up kind of really, really appreciating us. The big ones do too, but I think the big ones, it's more of a hurdle for them to get past the IT. We're happy to do it. And we've done it with companies like Turner and Qit. Um, I tell you McKinstry, they're about an $800 million uh, mechanical contractor out of Seattle. DPR is another one. Um, on the owner side, we've worked with Facebook Construction. We work um, like uh, quite a few others, as well as the software companies, Enscape, ClearEdge. I mean, there's a ton of, ton of software companies we've worked with. One of the big things that we like to talk about is that we're your technology partner. Um, I'm one of the founders and I'm actually currently the director of product my job in, and I have a team of two over here. We make sure that our products are, are always staying competitive. We make sure that our products are always going faster and improving. Um, that's my day-to-day -day role. I have a table over here. You can't see because the drop backdrop, but I have a table over here full of computer components, <laughs> full of test systems. And we're constantly trying to see how to make these things go faster. Um, I think the minute someone gets one of our systems and they get past that hurdle, they typically call back and say, the next one's faster, right? They, they're always asking us to go faster. Um, but, but being a technology partner and understanding what you and your company are trying to do, where you want to go, um, what your future initiatives are, are really what we are here for. Um, additionally, we work with a whole lot of software. So we'll have clients call us and say, hey, I'm trying to do something with drones. We can make three or four introductions with companies because we've worked with them. So we really like to be that value add on both sides of things. Um, our techs come from the industry. They know these products. They have contacts in the industry. Um, and, and it's really good sometimes to have someone to bounce ideas back from, 
hey, I'm looking for a computer that can do this. Are you interested in testing? Always the answer is yes. So that's one thing we bring value at. I like to show this scene. This is this is a recent photo um, that was that was sent to me. You'll have to excuse me. It's kind of blurry. Um, this was taken on a Saturday. <clears throat> I got a text message from one of our clients that was looking to get a new system. And this is one of their laser scanning techs. So if you count this out, he has four computers running right now. <clears throat> all, all, all processing laser scans. He has two laptops and two desktops that he has to process on because uh, neither one, none of them can actually process all this stuff by themselves. Um, so right now he's getting 500 gigabytes of raw scans per week. Um, just the capacity to process that takes 2.5 terabytes. Uh, they're working on external drives, which are about the slowest thing possible, even if they're in a solid state drive. Going through the USB port, it, it just takes time. It's not as fast as internal. The process right now, when they hit start on registering and processing scans, takes 45 hours. 45 hours, which is why he comes in on Saturday so he gets to hit start and hopefully see it by Tuesday. We move them to a larger capacity drive and we got them on one of our Ospreys and we cut the 45 hours down to four and a half hours. So now he didn't come in on Saturday, excuse me, Saturdays. He didn't come in on Sundays. He gets, he gets the scans registered the same day he gets them which I can't tell you, he was loving the fact that he was gonna be able to give all these computers back to IT, keep the monitors and have one system to work from. Um, I think this is just a testament to, to how we help people. Um, and, and, and we make something possible. I, I remember and I laughed at this when he sent it because I had a desk that looked a lot like this. This might look like your desk. It's a little messy. I'll tell you, I think, I think you could probably organize a little better with the paperwork. But um, this, is, this is a real workflow that we went from 45 hours to four and a half. Lastly, um, you know, I know this is a quick AEU booth. This is the first time we've ever done this. Typically we're face-to-face. -face, so hopefully we see you next year face-to-face, -face, fingers crossed. 2020 has been an interesting year. Um, hopefully you got to come by the booth last year. Uh, I don't think anyone last year at AU thought the next 12 months were going to look like they did. Um, but, you know, you, you get through stuff and, and live on and, and you're always a better person for it. I think that's something to take away. But what we can do, if you're interested, uh, shoot us an email or you can shoot me an email. My email is buck at bimboxusa.com. Um, we'll set up a system consultation. So we like to do this with companies. A lot of times companies have maybe two or three different user types. We can pair them up with the correct upgrades or the correct specifications um, and get you three user types. So then we can match your company up with specific systems. So when you call and say, I have a VDC manager, I have a coordination manager, I have a laser scanning tech, we already have the specifications that your company has decided on for those specific people. Um, so it makes it really easy if you're trying to scale across the company, pre-negotiated rates, all that good stuff. Um, and we even set up enterprise support emails that go directly to our head to head tech in the, in the office, as well as, as well as me. That way, if you have someone that goes down on a Saturday, they can get me and I can kind of start that process on the weekends. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. I appreciate you coming by the booth. Um, and I'm going to jump over and show you a quick video of our production facility. So one of the big things that we did this year um, was setting up a brand new facility. We, we built internally um, until I want to say last year, a little, about a month or two before AU, we went through the process of um, building, building out a brand new production facility. We were looking at that process and we decided we didn't want to do that. Um, we started interviewing some companies to see that had existing manufacturing facilities. And we bumped into a company called Ingram Micro. Ingram is the largest company that probably no one knows about. They're a $48 billion hardware service provider. Um, they actually supplement Amazon's uh, distribution warehouse hubs in many of their facilities. 
they have these integration hubs where they have teams, dust free environment, engineers, computer scientists that um, are going through and, and trying to figure this out. Well, it looks like Jody up. Pat, how are you doing today? Feel free to jump off mute, Pat, if you want to just catch up. Hey, Pat, do you mind if you don't have a microphone uh, typing in kind of what your company and what, what you do day to day? All right. Well, Pat, just to give you a quick overview, or excuse me, Jody, you're still here. I, it looked like you had fallen off. Um, so I'm going to show you a quick video on our, our production facility, and we'll get going from there. Okay, let me pull this up. Let me share my screen. And y'all have to bear with me. This is the first virtual conference I've done. Technical support coming in here. Don't forget to click those buttons to share the sound so it doesn't come through too quick. Nice, there we go. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, technical support. Okay, so this is our brand new production. In 2020, Bimbox brought on Ingram Micro as our manufacturing partner. The level of quality control and production output from partnering with Ingram has given us the ability to grow rapidly while maintaining a focus on our clients and products. Our new production allows us to offer higher volume orders with quicker turnaround times while maintaining our industry leading performance so our clients are always getting the fastest systems the fastest way possible. This is the new Bimbox. So this is what, what would happen was we partnered with Ingram. That facility you just saw is um, is off. It's, a, it's attached to a million square foot hub that has robotic automation. So when an order comes into Bimbox, it also doesn't matter the volume. Um, the components are pulled into what's called a bundle. Uh, a bundle, it, it's a kind of a packing box that has all the components for each individual system. So a company ordered 20 systems, 20 bundles would be delivered to the intro, beginning of the process in the integration facility. Um, the integration facility then scans all those components and assigns a barcode for each system. Then those bundles are wheeled in to the build station. Build stations, there are about 40 of them. They have about 40 engineers, 20 at any given time, but they can scale up. And the builders then start to build these systems. After that, it goes down to burn-in and quality control. Quality control puts it through the software testing, does our overclock tuning, um, a lot of automation involved in that. From there, it'll go to customer, or excuse me, customer success and whatnot, where they clean off the system. They do another test on packing to make sure everything's in the system. Everything is designed how we would want it designed. Um, and then it goes to shipping, and then it's out the door to clients. So right now we have an industry reading, um, no more than 14 days does the system ship to you. So that's, that's the amazing thing that we've transitioned to. We looked at the opportunity to build a sticks and bricks facility, decided against it. It was going to take three or four years to get it up and running. Um, logistics managers, a lot of overhead, a lot of people. Um, and with Ingram having five of these facilities across North America, this gave us the ability to scale. Each of these facilities can put out somewhere between 150 and 200 systems a day. So we have pretty much limitless growth as far as, to start as far as taking volume orders. Uh, additionally, Ingram having their buying power and their relationships in the industry, a lot of manufacturers have run out of parts or components. Um, and we've, we've not had that issue once um, throughout the entire year. We are prepared to fill orders up to 200 systems a week. Um, and we're happy to do that. So that's that's pretty much our new production facility. Pat, it looks like you're working at the Mayo Clinic. And uh, Samantha just joined us in here. So Pat, what do you do at the Mayo Clinic if you don't mind me asking? Oh. Yep. Excuse me, Jody, that, that makes 
Well, here, let me jump in. I'm going to answer Jody's question. So Jody, you're a heavy highway contractor. Utilize Topcon drone, aerial surveys. Are those fixed wing drones, I'm guessing? Um, and use context capture. I'm familiar with that. And right now you're using an HP ZBook notebook. Is that, is that, I'm guessing that's a laptop? Okay, so what we would recommend, and I'm gonna share my screen once again. Um, sorry, I'm jumping around four screens right now. So on our, if you have to go mobile, what we recommend to our reality capture teams is gonna be our M17. Uh, this system right here, 10 cores, 20 threads, up to 5.3 gigahertz, it is actually the best, the most powerful laptop possible. Context capture actually does use some GPU, but it takes every ounce of those threads as you process. <clears throat> Photogrammetry is just a highly, highly parallel process. It can be broken out into a lot of cores and threads. It traditionally uses almost every component in your system. Um, some of the code that they use is a little bit different. You can have up to eight terabytes of storage in here. It's very expandable, 17-inch um, screen. It's, it's the most powerful laptop on the market. Um, I actually have one sitting right here, um, but um, that that is definitely the system we would say go with. Uh, really, really good. If you notice back here, all these fans, this is due to the cooling. You can run four monitors off this, four 4K monitors. It's VR ready. You can do anything on this laptop, period. Um, so it's about an inch and a half thick at its thickest point. It's about the same size, if not smaller than a ZBook. I'll just tell you, I, I had a ZBook. I know kind of what you're talking about, mobile workstation. Um, but but it also has USB type C ports for updating that, uploading that data extremely fast. Um, and, and that is definitely the recommended system that we would put out there for you. Um, so if you have any questions, reach out to me, buck at binboxusa.com and we can kind of go through a deeper dive as far as how much RAM you need, what solid state drives you need, or what NVMe drives you need. Um, so that should should answer you. Topcon drones, I'm guessing that's that's his fixed wing, wait, fixed wing, fixed wing, if you if I'm guessing correctly. Um, especially with how many pictures you're probably taking um for the for the highway contract. That that thing needs to actually fly pretty far, and quadcopters don't do that. Any questions, Jody, before I jump one to Pat? Thank you so much and, and reach out to us. Um, I actually have a couple quadcopters here. Photogrammetry, I've been doing it for about seven years and it's more of a hobby for me. Um, using ground control points and whatnot, I actually ran Topcon survey tools for a while. So I, I am familiar and um, started out in civil project management. So I'm very familiar with what you're working on. Nice, Falcon 18, Falcon 8 plus strong. That's awesome. Topcon is, if you're using a Topcon drone, that's serious. Um, you're, not, you're not buying a DJI. <laughs> I like my Phantom 3 Pros. I like the Mavics. I'm just more of a hobbyist, but I would love to have that. I'm guessing you have, um, what is it? Our, uh, Falcon, I'm gonna have to look that up. I'm gonna make a note of that and, and look that back up. It's been a while since I've looked at the drones, but I remember when TopCon first came out, they had some of the most accurate um, data collection possible. Thanks, Jody. Um, jump to Pat. Pat, so you're an architectural BIM manager. Um, and with Mayo, where are you based out of? I, I thought so. I'm, I'm guessing around Jacksonville. Um, my, my parents actually live down there. Um, and in a past life, I was covering uh, the I was covering, yeah, I'm familiar with, with the Mayo Clinic down there. Um, so I, I uh, in a past life, I worked for Balfour Beatty Construction. Um, I was the uh, project solutions manager over the Southeast, but also did VDC work early in my career there um, in Florida. So I was covering Miami, Orlando, and uh, Jacksonville. 
So I, I was familiar with some of the work there. I still have some buddies down there. Um, they just finished up on the, uh, the new uh, Greyhound station downtown. So um, that's awesome. So Pat, I'm guessing you're working AutoCAD, Revit, maybe doing a little real-time rendering if, that, if that's on your purview. Um, and that's probably how you, what you're working in. Nice. And for rendering, are you using Inkscape, Lumion? Are you doing post-process rendering with V-Ray? What are your What are your tools of choice? Nice. We actually had uh, a, a buddy of mine, Josh Rattle. Um, I, I'll have to share my. If you share, if you reach out to me, I'll share his contact info. He just became the uh, the customer experience manager for the Americas. Amazing guy. Can help with Revit, Revit to Inkscape material maps and all that good stuff. Um, but but uh, no, I'm very familiar with Enscape. So Pat, are you looking, are you currently using desktops or laptops? And sorry for the text to talk. I, I know typically at AU we get to go face face and shake hands, but okay. Um, so Pat, our, I, I didn't get into it with you. Um, on, on the desktop side, we have our Striker 2 workstation. Um, one of the things about us, <clears throat> and just to give you a quick backstory, um, when I was working at Balfour Beatty in the, in the Southeast, I had a couple teams that got the Avatar theme project um, down in, uh, down in, or in uh, Orlando. Um, and the minute they started working with those Revit models and, and the Navisworks models, um, every, everything creeped to a crawl. Um, they, they, I mean, we spent close to $400,000 on that project team buying scanners and computers, actually it's probably like 650 when you factor in the scanners and everybody was having a bad experience. I mean, we bought really, really high-end Dell and HP workstations. Um, and, and as I started asking the question for our team manager, like why did we issue them the systems that they were issued? All he could tell me was that was the recommended BIM workstation, which I, the minute he said that, I realized that there was no good reason whatsoever. All right, thanks, Pat. Jump to the meeting, but shoot me buck at bimboxusa.com. Perfect, thanks, Pat. So Jody, um, it looks like you're hanging around. I want to catch up a little bit more about the civil projects you're doing. How many photos are you, are you pulling into? Um, are you pulling into context capture? Okay, it looks like we have Josh too, who is a um, works as a land surveyor um, using civil 3D and Leica. Awesome. Okay, so 200 to 250, um, <clears throat> yeah, that, that honestly, you could, for that capacity, I, it would be our Osprey workstation with 24 cores. Um, that would be more than enough for what you're doing and, and definitely if you started doing bigger projects. Um, when we look at our Osprey, there are three different kind of flavors of this and, and I say flavors, I hate to say that, but um, they're all that we have, it's either 24 core, 32 core, or 64 core. And we've done some really interesting data collection. I'm, I'm gonna pull over here and show you a quick, um, let me pull this up real quick. I did this yesterday. Uh, when we look at really parallel processes, we, we try to look up to this point before, before um, let me, a second, let me pull this up. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen real quick and kind of show you, it sounds like, this might be um, good as well for, well, I guess someone jumped out. Um, so Jody, when we're looking at reality capture, um, scanning and, and photogrammetry, are, they look for very similar systems. Um, what we did here is the client sent us 330 scans from a Faroth scanner, um, but the workflow and the processors are hit about the same. So this is probably overkill on data. But what we did here is we're comparing on the far right where it says 8280 times two. That's a dual 8280 Xeon system <clears throat> from Dell. 
That system costs thirty-five thousand dollars. Just the processors alone are ten thousand dollars each, and you have two of them, so that's twenty thousand dollars with the processors. Um, on the thirty-nine ninety X, I'll show we go back up because we have our other one in here. A thirty-nine seventy X is our thirty-two core Osprey, and our thirty-nine ninety X is our sixty-four core Osprey. Our thirty-nine sixty X, which is our twenty-four core Osprey was actually about two seconds faster than the $35,000 Dell um, when working with really parallel workflows. Uh, this is important, and I think especially for, for what you do, because it is taking time. I'm guessing, let me go back through and see what the time was for you. Yeah, eight hours on a ZBook, it's not gonna work. And actually I jumped to Osprey's, but with the 10, 10 core, 20 thread laptop, you're probably cutting that down Realistically, you're probably gonna cut that down to about three hours. Um, that's probably the best we're gonna be able to get you, um, maybe two and a half to three hours. It, it, it could probably actually be quicker than that with the GPUs we use. If you got a 2080 GPU, it would probably cut it down to more like an hour 45. Um, but we kind of wanna know what, what you were looking to do. If it's going from eight hours to four and a half, or if you're going eight hours and you want to get down to something like an hour and a half, that would kind of sway which way we could do this. Because either one of the desktops that we have, um, either one of the laptops that we have is going to cut that time dramatically. It's just how far down you want it to go. What is the ideal solution for you? Are we saying we want it as short as possible? Or are we saying, you know, if we cut that in half, that'd be a win. What's a win for you? All right, um, so what I would recommend, and I, and I think this is prob probably the best way to do it. One of the things that we offer that not many of our, our I guess a, I'd say our competition does, we have a 30 day buyback program. And in many instances, you can get net 30 terms. Um, so how it works, if you buy a system, you pick out everything you want, um, everything into the sun, right? Pick your, GPU, pick your RAM, you test it, it doesn't do make any improvement, you just send it back to us um, and we send you your money back or if you have net 30 terms, you keep it for 30 days and you never make a payment and send us back on the 29th day or the 30th day, you just say, hey, I don't want it. It's kind of like the blockbuster, if you're not satisfied, you get your money back, I hate to say it like that, but um, if you don't like the computer for any reason, uh, you send it back and, and we give it back to you. So. It's kind of one of these things if you wanted to test it and see and run it through context capture, I can tell you how much faster it's going to be. But if you actually wanted to get one, use it for a month and and see for yourself, it's really a kind of a no commitment thing. Um, so I would say that's probably the best bet. If you if you're okay with carrying something similar to your Z book, the 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 seventeen M is going to be the thing for you. Um, it, it's probably the same weight, same everything. Um, if you're looking to go smaller, which it doesn't sound like typically when people are doing photogrammetry, they just want to get the time down as far as possible. Um, that the, the 17 inch would be the best thing for you. 20 threads will, especially at the clock speed they're at is going to shred that data. I mean, it's going to, it's going to cut it down dramatically. I wouldn't think the Z book has more than six to eight cores. Um, if that, so you know, you know, you're going to be adding two double plus processing capability to that, which is why it's going to go down dramatically. And, and if you're using a ZBook, you're using a Xeon processor, which is some of the slowest processor out there. Um, so jumping to an iCore processor going close to 5.3 gigahertz, it's going to, it's going to probably do the processing twice as fast. So you're really getting 50%, twice as many cores going twice as fast, which is why you're going to see that 4x decrease in time. 
Um, and if you're using a, a ZBook right now, you probably have a Quadro graphics card. Jump into our GeForce cards, it's going to get the processing done faster on that side too, which is why, you know, anywhere from an hour and a half or an hour to an hour and a half um, is probably realistic on that process. Yeah, no, that's cool. Jody, if you, if you take my email down, ping me, we can get on a call. I'm always available. Um, and if I'm not, I can get one of our techs to jump on. Today, I'm, I'm doing booth duty by myself. Everyone else has to work. So um, you got stuck with me, but uh, we do have someone on our team that all they do is GIS. They work for a simple company, similar to me, but more recently. And they're really, really good with this stuff. They can help you out. Thank you. And Jody, hope you have a good day at the rest of the AU. I hope you find some cool stuff. Um, I know there's some good classes. I would, I would love to jump on like I used to attend, but I, um, I'm in booth duty for the next two days, which is great. It's just normally face to face with people. So this is different, but I appreciate you stopping by and talking with us and sharing what you do. See you, Jody. All right, everyone on social media, we're going to be jumping off, taking a quick break, but thanks for staying with us live. And if you have any questions, hit us up on Twitter, do it on the live link, and we'll answer it and respond. You are interacting with us. So please don't be shy. Um, ping in and, and let me go through something with you if you have any questions. Thanks. <laughs> 